The Hispanic community makes up the largest minority in the U.S. And Hispanics in North America share a common language, though they hail from at least 11 different countries of origin. And while there may be variations in background, food, and music preferences, one thing most Hispanics seem to share is an appreciation and value for family. This is Focus on the Family with your host, Focus President Jim Daly, along with Dr. Julie Slattery, and I'm John Fuller. And Jim, today marks the beginning of National Hispanic Heritage Month in the U.S., and I'm really glad we can take a moment to uh, turn the spotlight on Hispanic families in our communities. Uh, John, sometimes we forget that the family is a universal message. I remember in the early days of our international effort, probably around 1992 or 93, I was in Kenya and having lunch with uh, Dr. Lillian Wahomey at Kenyatta University. And I said, Lillian, do you think what we have to share about marriage and parenting will be accepted uh, in these countries? And she laughed and she said, oh, it's like an American to think you invented the family, mm. <laughs> which I thought was a good line. Yeah. Uh, so we had a good chuckle about that. Uh, and then she went on to say, you know, when you're talking about marriage and parenting, it is the universal language because every culture relates to that. Mm. And it cuts right across language barriers and even cultural barriers because everybody understands being married and raising kids. And guess what? Kids are the same around the world. Mm. Uh, Dr. Wahomey's point was families everywhere have the same problems. And uh, you know what? Our mission is to help them. Uh, today, we want to zero in on North America and specifically Hispanic families. So I am uh, really thrilled uh, to talk with our guest today. Our guest is Reverend Sam Rodriguez. He's the president of the Hispanic Evangelical Association. CNN named him the leader of the Hispanic evangelical movement, and the Wall Street Journal identified him as one of America's seven most influential Hispanic leaders. He's very well respected among his peers. He's a featured speaker at the White House on Hispanic American issues, and he and his wife Eva have been married for 22 years, and they live in California. Uh, Sam, it is great to have you here at Focus on the Family. Great to be here. Uh, paint a picture for us in the American culture today. Uh, what are we looking at? You have approximately 50 million Hispanics in America. 50 million. Out of the 50 million, you have approximately 16 to 18 million that identify themselves as born-again Christians. The rest, primarily up to 98% total, would identify themselves as Roman Catholic, of which 52% are Catholic charismatic. This is a community that is committed to God, and family. In Latin America, in every major Latino city south of the border, the centerpiece of the community is La Plaza, the church. The community is literally built around the church. The first thing ever built in the city was the church. The idea was that the church would always be and stand as the centerpiece of the community. When Latinos and Hispanics migrate to the United States, they bring their ethos, their culture, and that culture says it's God and family. It's faith in Christ and La Familia. So when we have so many discussions on how are Hispanics changing America, we have 50 million Hispanics, issues of immigration and other tangential issues that rise up. How are they impacting America? How are they going to transform America? Well, if these values are not American values, then we have things to worry about. It's God, family, and hard work. These are the values of the Latino community, of the Hispanic community. Uh -huh. Hispanics are not here in America to teach America the Macarena, Salsa, or Merengue. We're not here to prompt people to press one for English and two for Spanish. And we're not even here to increase the dividend portfolios for those that have invested wisely or unwisely in Taco Bell. I am convinced we are here to revitalize the values that have made this nation great. Well, Sam, God, family, and hard work. Yeah, and I would think you would agree that's every Christian's responsibility, isn't it? Without a doubt, without a doubt. But it is a community with a strong faith ethos. It is staunchly pro-life. It is staunchly in favor of defending the biblical tradition of marriage, but doing it all through the lens of compassion and, of course, that holistic, comprehensive biblical worldview where John 3.16 meets Matthew 25. As you say that, Sam, uh, I would guess that many Christians had never thought of uh, the Hispanic population growing for that purpose. Uh, maybe they have different views on uh, what the Hispanic culture is bringing. How would you challenge the average Christian who doesn't recognize uh, the role that God might be playing in this community? When you wake up in the morning, if you primarily identify yourself as Christian, then you can appreciate the fact 
that what we are experiencing in America are migratory trends with individuals that have a commitment to the same Judeo-Christian value system that this nation was founded upon. So America should really say, we bless and praise God that the immigrants coming to this country love Jesus, love family, and love hard work. Well, Sam, let's talk about that. As John mentioned, you're the president of the Hispanic Evangelical Association. Uh, how do you partner with communities to see things come about? Right. We're committed to this idea. It's very revolutionary. It's very new. Here we go. It's very radical. This idea of the cross. Wow. You know, the quintessential symbol of Christianity around the world. But we see things through the optics of the cross. That cross being both vertical and horizontal. And it is both vertical and horizontal, mind you. So vertically, it is salvation. At a horizontal level, it is transformation. Vertically, it is covenant. At a horizontal level, community. It is both righteousness and justice, sanctification and service. It is John 3.16 and Matthew 25. It is ethos and pathos. It's Billy Graham and Mother Teresa. And we want to see ourselves and the Christian church, or better yet, the American church, emerge and stand at the point of convergence, the nexus, the intersect, where the vertical and the horizontal intersect. Historically, the majority of uh, Western European, Anglo-Saxon, white evangelicals would primarily focus on vertical issues. And the communities of color, uh, ethnic Christians, African Americans primarily, would focus on horizontal issues. We come along and say, why does it have to be either or or either or? It could be both and. Let's stand at the point where they both intersect, where we are both righteousness and justice, where we are 100% staunchly pro-life, but equally committed to alleviating poverty, both domestically and around the world. Can we be both and? Can we be both righteousness and justice? Can we be both Billy Graham and Mother Teresa? And I believe we can. And that's a, a, a solid and holistic church. Sam, it's one of the things that uh, often the media may be critical of focus on the family because they see... Uh, poverty, and they think and believe that every Christian charter should be about poverty. Uh, many Christian organizations do different things uh, according to their charter. For focus on the family, uh, when that criticism comes, w what we have often said is that we fight the number one predictor of poverty, which is to keep a family together, to uh, limit divorce, because the number one predictor of poverty is is divorce. When a man leaves his wife, usually the woman and the children fall below the poverty line. And that's just a unique way of looking at that. So fighting the very thing uh, that we stand for each and every day, fighting divorce, actually uh, does the most significant thing to fight poverty. Jim, in our community, in the Hispanic American community, that is the primary antidote. Mom and dad in the home in a healthy marriage, that's the number one antidote against the proliferation of gangs, mm -hmm. high school dropout, teen pregnancy, and, and the major social ills that we confront in our communities. Mm. So to us, it's not a matter of even an outreach or, or a ministry. It's the very survivability of our community. Sam, we uh, talked earlier, and I, I uh, was born and grew up for a while there in East L.A., West Covina, yeah. and, uh, you know, understood the Hispanic community living there and, and really mixed with everyone. Uh, it was a wonderful experience in that regard. Uh, talk about the Hispanic family. Uh, one of the great things I love from the Hispanic American family unit is his commitment to mom and dad and to the next. It's connecting Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and us again, even to Joseph on occasion. Uh, but I think that's something that, that the collective American, non-Latino community can learn and appreciate. Uh, the convocation around the dinner table, which is what, the Norman Rockwell sort of picture mm -hmm. of the American family? We need to revitalize that. We need to resurrect that. We still have that in the Hispanic family. Mm -hmm. And we go around, even when we are upset and not necessarily on, in one accord, that, that carne asada, that steak plank really brings us together and then conversations begin. One other thing that I'm reminded of are the rites of passage that you celebrate. That, those rites of passage are critical to us. Can you tell us just a, a little bit about what that is? Well, first, let me, you know, the disclaimer is we like to celebrate a lot. <laughs> That's uh, a good I, thing. I mean, I, mean, I just want well, to be clear there. It's, uh, it's, it's, you know, we have a schedule. The schedule rounds around the various celebrations that we have embedded in the calendar. Uh, but even in, in life's journey, La Quinceañera, the rites of passage for that teenage girl, understanding that she is shifting from being a little girl to a young lady. Um, and we celebrate that. And it, it's almost like a little junior uh, prelude to a wedding. 
uh, and everything's out. We're talking about the, and trust me, the expenditures <laughs> and the expense account does reflect that. Yeah, you're speaking from uh, personal experience. Yeah, personal aren't experience. You? Uh, yeah, it's the preamble, but it, it really celebrates these critical moments in the, the development of teenagers within our home and our families. And it's, it's very engaging. One of the beautiful things about the Latino family is the ability to communicate. So there's a lot more, let's just say, transparency. Sometimes, unfortunately, it becomes a bit volatile. Uh, but there is communication. One way or another, it's either joy, celebration, conversation, or uh, uh, let's just say a vociferous exchange. Uh, <laughs> but it's there. And I like the fact that there's always an open dialogue, for better or worse. Hey, Sam, can you describe for us uh, just a typical day in a Hispanic family? I mean, when dad gets home at night, what's going to happen? Dad gets home at night in, in a Latino family, just like in American, if kids are doing homework or, or some of them may be watching television or something. But the moment dad comes at home, there is an acknowledgement that dad's at home. Um, in the typical Latino family, first generation, you better believe it. There's an acknowledgement. In many first generation families, according to what nation you come from, they will not, if it's all possible, dinner will not be served till dad arrives. And dad becomes not the center of attention, but dad's at home. You know, the protector has arrived. And there's, there's a conversation, not only in how was your day, but looking at some of the daily metrics. Did you do your homework? Was this done? Was this done? Was this done? And then frank conversation about anything, anything having to do with church, family, popular culture, politics, whatever it may be, it emerges. In certain communities, particularly in the Caribbean, the children will not go to sleep at night without asking, which I think is so beautiful, asking for what is called the blessing. So before they go to sleep at night, Hispanic children from Caribbean nations go to mom and dad and say, bendicion, which means, can you bless me before I go to bed tonight? And, and then every time they see mom and dad for the first time that day, they would ask for la bendicion, the blessing. I find that to be beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I want to transmit that uh, to my grandkids one day, hopefully. That's beautiful. Uh, talk about the role of moms in the Hispanic family. Oh, moms. <laughs> they're, they're really the center of attention. Well, right, well, Julie? Well, well, <laughs> no, well, no, actually, in, in the Latino community, uh, my grandmother, uh, 12 children, uh, 86 grandchildren, and she, she was the queen, the matriarch. She was the queen. It all, it all realmed around Abuelita. It all realmed around her, uh, her role. And uh, well, same thing I would argue with, with uh, Western European Anglo families, but the spirituality, the prayer component, mom's role is, for whatever reason, the lead intercessor. It's the person who held the spiritual mantle, not as the high priest. We understand the role of the, of the male and the father at home. But my grandmother, my mother, still gave more of, of a supervisory role to making sure that everyone was prayed for. What's your prayer request? What are you going through? What can I come in agreement for? And that mother at home is not only the person who is the, the caretaker and the person who's there to bring them together, but to provide that sort of spiritual nourishment. That is the high priest. That commends them. Here, it's God. Here are the values. And mom is more of that COO who's there daily to make sure it takes place. Dad mm -hmm. is the CEO, but mom is that, that strong COO. And when mom does it, a Latino woman, it's, it's like, you know, it's a Hispanic woman who loves God on Starbucks with salsa sauce on top. So that's a lot of energy. <laughs> Haven't had that latte yet. No, <laughs> no I, uh, but I can tell you as a mom, having that defined for me uh, would be so powerful. I think so many moms in North American culture want to lead their kids spiritually, but they keep hearing, oh, that's dad's role. So uh, somehow I've got to get him to do it. But you're saying that mom plays a really, really important part of connecting a child's heart to the heart of God. Without a doubt. It's the CEO, COO role. And, and it's the daily dad will lay out the macro, macro plan. These kids will absorb by faith, will embrace the following core values. Mom, it is your responsibility to make sure it happens. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working. The hard work i got to supply. Mom, yeah. you execute. Uh, so it, 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 and it really works out well. Mm.